You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? I T G with Wes, Owen, and Jed. What are they called again? Wes, Jed, and Owen. That's a West Virginia touchdown. You end up like a dog that's been beat too much. That's me. <laughs> Dude, he is a salty dog. A dog. You're a junk out dog. Yeah. Dirty smelling dog. Breaks a tackle. Heads to the end zone. Another touchdown for the Mountaineers. Uh, I thought we were really physical up front. We looked like we were having a lot of fun. That there's a Tasmanian devil. I do a pretty wicked Tasmanian devil. <laughs> you sound like you were underwater. <laughs> you're t- hold on, you're too close to the microphone. You sound more like SpongeBob. Bubble Buddy. You are... In the gun. Once you enter this family, it's no getting out. In the gun, episode 164. I'm Skylar Callahan. That is the signal caller, Jed Drenning. Wes and O are out for this episode, but we'll get them back here soon. We are going to talk a little bit about the NCAA and all the shenanigans that's going on with them, as there always is. Every single summer, it's either conference realignment, NCAA ticking somebody off whatever so we'll get into that here in a little bit we'll also talk about a new west virginia wide receiver jed will give the breakdown on that but first this episode is brought to you as always by bet online your number one source for all your betting needs bet online where the game starts and also a shout out to toothman ford we all know cars cost less in graft and we support those who support the mountaineers and also who support this podcast so jed New West Virginia wide receiver, Justin Robinson, commits from Mississippi State. This is something that we kind of knew was going to come at some point. They hadn't had that big, long, physical, vertical threat in this receiving room yet. A lot of small guys that got that can play inside. They have some guys that can play outside, but they didn't have that true big guy like a Bryce Ford Wheaton or a, uh, a Devin Carter. They just didn't have that. Now they do with Justin Robinson. Give us the skinny on the new guy. I, I start with this. When you look at the the composition of the receiver room, the closest you would have had prior to this acquisition would have been Jaden Bray coming out of Oklahoma State. Now, Jaden yeah. Bray's a 6'2 plus kid. He's long, but he plays big. He's a physical right. kid, a 50 50 ball type kid. The thing that I like about Jaden Bray, when you when you watch him on tape, the metrics support what you saw on tape. And what I mean by that is I think he had the fourth highest win rate in 50-50 balls in the Big 12. They had double-digit attempts they threw his way, and he caught seven or eight out of like 11. So he was a physical presence on the perimeter, and and he does have a certain strength to him. Plays bigger than he is. But now you have a kid in Justin Robinson who's 6'4", 220, and has that legit true frame, as you talked about, much like a Devin Carter-type build. And he comes here with an already existing body of work, in this new age, this is kind of normal. This is his third landing yeah. spot. He started at Georgia, <laughs> was a very highly coveted recruit coming out of Georgia, spent a couple of years as a Bulldog, transfers to Mississippi State, and was very productive at Mississippi State. Even, you know, was a, the MVP of their bowl win over Illinois. So this is a kid who's made some things happen and more specifically, made some things happen within the confines of an air raid offense. He played for Mike Leach in that air raid offense before Mike Leach passed away. So from a schematic standpoint, I couldn't help but notice when watching him on tape, a lot of the concepts were some of the concepts that Neil Brown still integrates into what he does offensively from the mesh on down the line. So I would expect uh, there to be if anything, a minor hiccup in the transition from the terminology and the understanding of the big picture of what we're trying to do from a pass game standpoint, from an offensive standpoint. So you like the idea or the hopes of a guy like Justin Robinson after playing in a system like that previously, at least at one point in his career, to be able to step into West Virginia and just one more version of the air raid branch of things and uh, and kind of pick up probably on third base instead of first or second base in terms of his knowledge of the offense or what's what the expectations would be. But when you look on that perimeter, yeah, all of a sudden we built some size out there. You've got him, you've got Jaden Bray, as we talked about, a guy who plays very strong. Uh, Traylon Ray, 
uh, is a guy that we think has a very bright future and talk about a guy who plays bigger than he is. So, you know, you're going to move Huddy around, uh, Preston Fox moving around, Jarrell Williams. You have some options in this room. So you have multiple guys now that are potential bigs on the perimeter, multiple guys that are slot types. But the beauty of cross-training so many of those guys is going to put you in a pretty solid position conceptually uh, in terms of what you can do from a matchup standpoint. So I, I think it's a great acquisition. This guy uh, has, uh, what is it, one year or two years remaining, Skylar? I, yeah, at least I, it's, one it's year, confusing. Obviously. It's confusing because of the pandemic years. So I've, I've seen yes. two, or there's two to play one. I think he has one, but... It might be two to play one. I, I still haven't got confirmation on it, but it's, that's it's going to be twenty thirty two before we we wash exactly. clean of all these 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 it's issues ridiculous. that the pandemic <laughs> is still affecting from you know an eligibility standpoint. But but either way, he's a guy that should be able to st step in absolutely and contribute right out of the gate. So I think it's an exciting acquisition. Again, hats off to Drew Fabianich, our guy, the general manager at West Virginia. Hats off to the staff, and uh, and nice pickup. Yeah, well, I think it also kills two birds with one stone. You not only get that big, long physical target, but you also kind of lessen the load or lessen the pressure on the young kids like a Clement, Traylon, Ray, Rodney Gallagher. Obviously, they're going to be counted on still at a high level, but when you have him, you have Jaden Bray, you have Cole Taylor, and also too, Jed, I wanted to ask you this. With Jen Ross now in the mix at tight end, I wonder yeah. how much that means that they can do with Cole Taylor maybe playing in the slot and having two of those guys on the field at the same time. Well, I, I like the fact that because also don't forget who got significant reps with Cole Taylor out, who got significant reps Traylon. in the spring. All right. You, Davis, you see Dixon, this. Yep. And, well, and not just Will Dixon. Let's let's walk through who populates that room. Who played significantly last year Traylon. in that yep. room? That, that's right. As a physical kid who knows his role, so now all of a sudden you might be in position with different guys with different skill sets. You have a receiving threat. You have a guy who can kind of do both. You have a blocking threat. So you might be in position to toss a little 12 personnel their way. And one more thing to have to prepare for if you're facing West Virginia offensively. But again, the versatility from a personnel standpoint of what Neil and the staff will be able to do uh, I think put you in very good standing. Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and get to a break here real quick. On the other side, we're going to talk about the NCAA, get you up to date on what everything is going on with them. Uh, but first, a shout out to Fortis for roof performance and financial certainty guarantee. Be sure to visit fortis.us.com. We'll be back right here on In the Gun. Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, where cars cost less. In Grafton and at ToothmanFord.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In the Gun Podcast. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations, with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. If you work the land, you just got to be a jack of all trades type. There's just too much to do. 
So if you got to be a welder or a farmer or a ditch digger, that's just who you are that day. Then tomorrow, you can be somebody else. Get your coyote at the new location of Johnston Equipment between Weston and Buckhannon. Back in the gun, a lot is going on in the NCAA world and the NIL, the payments, all this stuff, the pay for play. It's a lot to wrap your head around, Jed, and I don't know if this is going to get settled anytime soon, but a big report came out uh, from Ross Dellinger of Yahoo Sports and really detailed this thing down to a T. Go ahead and give us the synopsis of this whole situation and also your thoughts on whether or not this is good or bad uh, in terms of the progress for the future of our sports. All of the above, there, there are a lot of moving parts in this and and Ross Dellinger has done a great job in detailing this and chronicling what's been happening with these court cases. There are three major antitrust suits that have been hanging out there, kind of the albatross around the neck of the NCAA. Now, if something didn't happen to settle these things, the NCAA could be forced to take these things to court and be staring down the barrel of back payments in the form of 20 billion, 20 billion with a B dollars owed to former athletes for name image likeness issues before that was squared away in 2021. So if you did go to court, that's what you might be looking at among other things. And you would also be forced to pay it almost right away. But instead an offer was put on the table by the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs being the players saying, Hey, instead of going to court and potentially facing that, how about we offer you this instead? And the offer included two point, basically $2.8 billion over the course of 10 years for the NCAA to pay back to these plaintiffs. Now, yeah. in addition to the $2.8 billion that the NCAA will have to pay these plaintiffs, uh, you're also talking about a couple other things that we've talked in the past on the podcast about, a new compensation model that would be theoretically capped at 22% of the media rights deals and the other financials of the power conferences. And that would be shared with the players as well in a rev sharing structure. And finally, this is where the conversation about overhauling the scholarship or more specifically the roster structure would take place. Uh, we spent an episode last week talking about potentially there are 85 scholarship players on a power conference football team but there's more than that on the roster like 110 115 120 on the roster counting the walk-ons what they might be looking at doing to streamline that is put a cap on the actual roster number itself saying hey this walk-on stuff has to go the way of the dinosaur those kids will probably end up landing at g5 schools as scholarship players but in the meantime if we're going to go with an 85 roster limit all those kids are going to have to be on scholarship. We talked again last week about what BYU did with one of their boosters a few years ago. And I think that kind of scared the NCAA in terms of how they view this. You had a booster at BYU pay every player on the roster through an NIL deal and in effect put 120 kids on full scholarship. And that defeats the purpose of the scholarship limit. So now the NCAA is of the mindset that we got to revisit what roster numbers look like. Now, when you look at the ancillary sports or the Olympic sports or the secondary sports, you might have different things happen that could even be beneficial. Like baseball is the example we use. There's 11.7 scholarships available for a 32 player roster. Maybe that ends up with 28 players and they're all on scholarship. Who knows what it might look like, but that's part three of this settlement deal if these things, in fact, play out, which now, most critically, right before we started taping, Skylar, the Pac-12 was the last standing conference to not vote yay on this, and they did just conference. about an hour ago. <laughs> so now, yeah, it's not even Power 5, it's Power Conference, but here you have two members of the Pac-12, but Too bad. that notwithstanding, it looks like maybe even as soon as tonight, this episode's going to drop tomorrow and Friday, but maybe as soon as Thursday night, uh, the NSA will reach out to the court and say, look, the settlement has been accepted by all parties. That might put this in action, some version of it, by as early as the fall of 2025. But stay tuned 
because this stall has to be ironed out, mapped out, what in fact it might look like. But you could see some seismic changes. I, I've said in the past, I do sense that some of the changes still to come might make the changes that have come in the last three or four years seem like small potatoes. That sounds crazy, but it really might. But what, what to me, the part that is still open in the settlement, they've left open the possibility of some form of collective bargaining down the down the line. Have and to. I do think that has to happen for all this to truly get settled. Some version of that's going to have to happen and to to really sate all parties and all parties truly get what they want, including the plaintiffs, including the players, because right now you're looking at you and I talked about this, Skylar, a 22 percent rev share number from the financials. So out of the money bucket, you're going to pull 22 percent and pay the athletes. Normally, when you have a collectively bargained number, which this isn't, which is why I think it will come to that, that number approaches, it comes a lot closer to approaching 50% if it's right. going to be a rev share number through a collectively bargained situation. So I would think at some point down the road, we're going to see more change, and that change will come in the form of the athletes organizing in some form or fashion whatever you want to call that, union or otherwise, and they'll come to the table with one voice and an arbiter is going to have to decide, okay, you want this, you want that, now let's settle this and come up with some form of a CBA. But right now we don't have that. Right now you have a settlement offer to put these cases, these antitrust cases to bed for now. So that's kind of what this looks like, but it's far from all over. That's just big news this week in terms of the presidents of the power conferences accepting the settlement to get the 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 ball rolling in this direction yeah and, and from what i've kind of noticed in past especially on the baseball side of things when these things get in front of the arbiter they tend to side side with like in baseball if you have a player that's up for arbitration and you have the team putting in their offer usually they go with the player's side so or they try to bump it up a little bit to where the player gets the benefit yeah. I kind of see that being the same way here. And like you said, 22% just doesn't seem realistic. So even if it's, I don't know, 38%, that seems a little bit more ideal, I think, for both sides. But yeah, a far, far away from this thing being settled. And I don't think that it, it's not going to be not just this, but the whole landscape of the NCAA, I don't think is going to be crystal clear, maybe within the next five or six years. We're, we're still going to be going through a bunch of different changes, a bunch of different rules. Heck, the NCAA may, a, may not even exist in a few years. We talked about that before we uh, recorded. Sure. There's been multiple times where we thought this is where the NCAA was going to collapse. This is kind of another one of those situations. Could this spark something? We'll see. So, uh, it's, last worth, it's worth mentioning as well, yeah. Skylar, that one of the things you and I talked about off air, we, we read through the article once again by Ross and, and – this settlement offer also doesn't resolve the issue of Title IX. They're exactly. going to leave that open to be settled in the courts. That's a so whole separate issue. That is that is a matzo ball right there that that to continue as is is going to become supremely difficult under the current structure. So if, in fact, you separate from the NCAA, maybe that impacts that as well. But there's going to be some court cases in and around that, I would imagine. So. Sure. Stay tuned, but this was a pretty significant piece of news on this front, as boring as it might otherwise topically <laughs> seem, right? So. Right. Yep, it's always a loud summer out there in the NCAA. I'm sure conference realignment, that's going to be coming around the door here soon, too. Someone's going to make a move, and, and we'll see those dominoes. Because, hey, the Pac-2, there's still two schools that technically need to, a new long-term home. So who knows who snatches those up? A last shout-out to Johnson's Equipment. Uh, check out their new location on Route 32, 33 between Weston and Buckhannon. And as always, be an ear and tell an ear about your new WV football podcast in the gun. For Jed Drenning, I'm Scala Callahan. Make sure you hit the subscribe button on our YouTube page at In the Gun Podcast. You can follow us on X at the same handle. And we'll see you guys here soon. Take care. I T G. The fun doesn't have to stop here. Be sure to hit subscribe and never miss an episode. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, be sure to follow us on X at In The Gun Podcast. Join us again next time. Until then, 
Tell an ear to tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. I love the state. I love I got a chance to play here. And uh, this is awesome. This is the way I pitched it. This mission is over. It's over. 